Hello students. Students, now the INICT November 2022 exam is over and I hope you all must have performed according to your expectations. So today we will discuss the recall based pediatric questions that appeared in the exam so that the mistakes that we committed in exam, we can rectify those mistakes in the future exams. Okay. So now let's begin with the questions. These are recall based questions. So just look into it. Okay. Coming to the question number one. At what age does handedness in a child develop? So this is such a direct question. We have discussed this topic in development of the child. Okay. So handedness in a child develops by what age? Which age? Okay. And the options are. 2 years, 3 years, 4 years and 5 years. So, you all must know that the handedness develops by 3 years of age. So, answer is B. It develops by 3 years of age. It means that the child is left handed or the right handed. So, this develops by 3 years of age. And by 4 years of age, the child has discrimination of the left and the right side. Okay. So, the answer is 3 years. So, development topic is students very, very important topic. Every time the question is being asked from this topic. So, you have to remember the development topic, you have to learn it. Okay, now coming to the second question. How to measure the height of a child? In a case when the normal height measurement is not possible. So, this is somewhat a tricky question. Okay. So, look at the options now. Number first is CRL. Students, CRL is crown rump length. Crown rump length. Okay. So, what is crown rump length? So, this is the term that you must seen in the antenatal ultrasounds. Crown rump length. CRL. So, this is the length of the fetus or embryo. Okay, when the embryo is present in the mother's womb, at that time, the length from the crown, that is the top of the head of the fetus, to the bottom of the buttocks, that is crown rump length. And through it, the normal height measurement is not possible at all. So, this option is wrong. Number second is the head circumference. So, the head circumference, the head circumference of child, it has no correlation with the height of the child. So, this option is also wrong. Next option is arm span. Okay. So, arm span student is the right answer. How? Firstly, what exactly is the arm span? So, arm span is the length from the tip of the middle fingers of both the arms when the arms are stretched. Okay. So, this if this is a person who is standing, with the arms stretched, so from the tip of the middle finger of the both, so this distance is the arm span. Okay, and we say that at birth, the arm span of the child is the arm span is less than the length of the baby by around 2.5 centimeters. This is at birth. And arm span is equal to the length of the baby at the age of around 11 years. Okay. And after 11 years, the arm span is more than the height of the baby, height of the child by around less than 1 centimeter difference. Okay. So, this is what that can be easily correlated with the height of the child. Okay. If we can't measure the height actually. So, these, this is exactly given in Ghai. And this is what the answer is C. The fourth option is knee height. So, students, knee height, what exactly is the knee height? It is the height from the knee to the, to the bottom. So, this is also not the answer. The knee height can sometimes be used to measure the height of the child in critically ill patients who are not ambulatory. Okay, or the intubated patients or the patients with cerebral palsy. Okay, but the right answer is arm span. Okay, then coming to the next question. A child presents to the OPD with an 
एग्जेसबेशन ऑफ ब्रॉन्कियल एस्मा अगेन अ वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टॉपिक स्टूडेंट्स फ्रॉम द ओ पी डी पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू इन योर क्लिनिकल प्रैक्टिस टू यू सी अ लॉट नंबर ऑफ पेशेंट्स लाइक दिस एंड मोस्ट टाइम्स दिस क्वेश्चन इज बीन आज इन द एग्जाम्स एग्जेसबेशन ऑफ द ब्रॉन्कियल एस्मा अ पेशेंट विजिट टू यू इन द ओ पी डी वट इज द नेक्स्ट स्टेप इन मैनेजमेंट सो हाउ विल यू मैनेज दिस पेशेंट द ऑप्शन डेट आर गिवन आर एक्स रे यू विल स्टार्ट ऑक्सीजन स्टार्ट प्रेडनी सोलोन एंड सेल्ब्यूटमोल इनहेलेशन ओके सो आई हैव डिस्कस्ड इन द टॉपिक ऑफ ब्रॉन्कियल एस्मा टू फर्स्टली वेन लेट्स टॉक अबाउट वॉट इज द एग्जेसबेशन ऑफ ब्रॉन्कियल एस्मा ओके सो एग्जेसबेशन ऑफ ब्रॉन्कियल एस्मा द सिवियरिटी इज डिवाइडेड इन टू माइल्ड मॉडरेट सिवियर एंड विद इम्पेंडिंग रेस्पिरेटरी फेलियर ओके सो on the basis of symptoms and certain signs we can easily make, make it out like the child is suffering from mild moderate or severe uh, bronchial asthma it is very important to differentiate the category because your treatment will slightly change according to it okay so in the mild bronchial asthma the symptoms the breathlessness is only present at the time of walking in moderate the child is breathless at rest <sighs> at rest okay in severe also at rest and in impending respiratory failure there is extreme dyspnea then in the mild case the child can lie down but in moderate case the child prefers to sit even if you make him lie down he will prefer to sit okay in severe he will sit upright and in impending respiratory failure it will be upright or leaning forward okay then a mild patient can talk in sentences like a normal person moderate they talk in phases severe is not able to even talk only words will he will be able to say okay why because of the breathlessness and impending respiratory failure he is unable to talk then alertness mild is alert but he may be agitated moderate and severe are usually agitated they are irritable child and in impending respiratory failure they are drowsy okay now the signs that we have to look for are the tachypnea because the respiratory distress we are talking about the breathlessness so we have to look for the tachypnea so these all patients are tachypneic okay then the use of accessory muscles against uh, again a sign of respiratory distress that is not present in mild but is seen in moderate and severe and in impending respiratory failure very very important students paradoxical movement thoracic abdominal movement is seen for paradoxical breathing is there we have it's very important that we have to differentiate this subtype because these are the patients that need immediate intubation so that you can save them okay so this then v's in the mild only end expiratory v's in the moderate throughout the expiration in severe both during inspiration and expiration there is v's but again there is absence of v's that is also known as silent chest is present in the cases of impending respiratory failure now pulse rate there is tachycardia is there okay so pulse rate is increased in mild moderate severe all the cases but in impending respiratory failure there is bradycardia so these are important points bradycardia silent chest okay paradoxical breathing these all are seen in impending respiratory failure now what we look for is the saturation spo2 of the patient okay so we will apply the saturation probe in the mild patients saturation at the room air is absolutely normal more than 95% in the moderate cases it's 90 to 95% severe less than 90% and in impending respiratory failure the saturation does not increase even after application of the oxygen by mask so this is how you differentiate you make out the severity of the bronchial asthma exacerbation of the bronchial asthma and now your management will depend upon this severity okay so in the management mild to moderate cases as the patient comes to you at that time only apply the oxygen by the mask and you have to make the patient nebulize with beta 2 agonist short acting beta 2 agonist salbutamol okay so we have to put the mask on the oxy oxygen mask to the child then we have to nebulize with the short acting beta 2 agonist salbutamol and a uh, oral corticosteroid at that point of time do wonders so this is very important oral corticosteroids okay so this is the line of management that is to be given in mild to moderate cases 
and in the severe cases the change is because the child in the severe patient the severe patient will might not might not be able to take a oral corticosteroid so you can consider a iv corticosteroid in this case and also we have to consider iv magnesium and high doses of uh, inhaled corticosteroids okay and then we have to further look how the child is improving and accordingly we will manage the child okay so now coming to the question that was being asked in the exam was that like the child of the exacerbation with bronchial asthma came to you in the opd so the management will be chest x ray will it do any benefit to us the chest x ray as we know it's already labeled that child is a case of exacerbation of bronchial asthma so there is no need of chest x ray x ray would have been required if we don't know the cause of the respiratory distress in the child as in the question it's already mentioned exacerbation of bronchial asthma so no need of chest x ray it will do no help in the management of the patient okay next start oxygen yes the first point is we have to start oxygen in the child we have to give the salbutamol inhalation salbutamol you all know is a short acting beta 2 agonist okay and you have to start prednisolone okay prednisolone is a corticosteroid so you have to immediately give first dose of prednisolone which will definitely help the patient okay so answer is 2 3 and 4 so the correct option is c okay so students this bronchial asthma topic is very important from exam point of view a lot number of times the questions are been asked from this topic so i have told you very crisply that what is the management exactly in bronchial asthma okay now next question which of the following cyanotic heart disease present with increased pulmonary blood flow so look at the statement the cyanotic heart disease with increased pulmonary blood flow okay and the options are tetralogy of fallot epstein anomaly tga that is the transposition of great artery hypoplastic left heart syndrome and tricuspid atresia okay so students all these options are cyanotic heart disease first point now we have to look for the cyanotic heart disease with increased pulmonary blood flow okay so now we will look for these options one by one so when we talk about the tetralogy of fallot what exactly is tetralogy tetralogy means four components okay so four components are number first is there is ventricular septal defect number second is there is overriding of the aorta third is there is right ventricular hypertrophy and fourth is there is pulmonary stenosis you all know these are the four components and as you know because there is pulmonary stenosis is there so how can the pulmonary blood flow increase so tetralogy of fallot is associated with decreased pulmonary blood flow okay next epstein anomaly so in epstein anomaly what happens exactly is there is downward displacement of the tricuspid valve okay so look at the heart diagram so this is the tricuspid valve this is the proper location of the valve ring this is the annulus okay when there is downward displacement of the tricuspid valve so now there is downward displacement of tricuspid valve so what happens is the right atrial size increases there is atrialization of the right ventricle and the right ventricular size decreases this is what happens exactly in the epstein anomaly now what happens is this right ventricle some becomes non functional this is not able to function and the right ventricular size decreases a lot and because of this there is pulmonary stenosis there is functional pulmonary stenosis that happen there is right ventricular tract obstruction is there because of which now again there will be decrease pulmonary blood flow is there okay so epstein anomaly is associated with decrease pulmonary blood flow now number third when we talk about the transposition of great arteries what happen in transposition of great arteries as the as the statement itself tells the transposition of great arteries the two great arteries that are present in heart are pulmonary artery and aorta pulmonary artery arises from the right ventricle and the aorta arises from the left ventricle okay this we all know but in transposition what happens is the right ventricle aorta arises from the right ventricle and pulmonary artery arises from the left ventricle this is what transposition is and we all know that the tga is 
in order to be sustainability of life the tga is always associated with the ventricular septal defect most common association is ventricular septal defect so in this case what happens is there will be because of the ventricular septal defect there will be increased pulmonary blood flow is there so tga is the anomaly which is associated with the increased pulmonary blood flow okay now next when we talk about the hypoplastic left heart syndrome hypoplastic left heart syndrome so again as the name suggests hypoplasia of the left side of the heart the left side what all structures do we have so we have a mitral valve and we have the aortic valve so two valves are present in the left side of the heart so there is hypoplasia of both mitral valve and the aortic valve hypoplasia and stenosis of these valves and also there will be hypoplasia of the left ventricle so in order to supply the blood to the body now what happens is the blood is not able to go from the left atrium to the left ventricle hypoplasia of the structures so it's always associated with the atrial septal defect so a atrial septal defect is always present okay now what happens is through the atrial septal defect the blood from the left atria it goes into the right atria from the right atria into the right ventricle through the right ventricle it goes to the pulmonary artery now from the pulmonary artery the blood goes into the the um, aorta through the structure that is known as the patent ductus arteriosus so through this structure the blood goes into the aorta and then supplies the upper and lower part of the body so as whole of the blood goes into the pulmonary artery so it is the condition that was associated with the increased pulmonary blood flow okay so next the condition tricuspid atresia as the name itself suggests atresia of the tricuspid valve so the blood can't go from the right atrium to the right ventricle because of the atresia of the tricuspid valve and so because of it the pulmonary blood flow will definitely decrease because the right ventricle is connected to the pulmonary artery okay so it's associated with the decreased pulmonary blood flow now when we talk in gross the conditions that are associated cyanotic heart disease associated with increased pulmonary blood flow these are transposition of great artery i told you total anomalous pulmonary venous return so student this is the condition in which all the pulmonary blood flow that normally comes to the left atrium instead of coming to the left atrium it joins the right atrium so there is total mixing of the blood oxygenated and deoxygenated blood in the right atrium okay so this is the condition as this blood from the right atrium total blood from the right atrium goes to right ventricle and then to the pulmonary artery so there will be increased pulmonary blood flow again truncus arteriosus the truncus arteriosus is the condition when there is a single trunk that is coming from the both lower ventricles so there is a communication between the two ventricles a single trunk is coming and that trunk then divides into afterwards into the pulmonary artery and the aorta okay so the pressure between the right and the left ventricle remains the same so a whole amount of blood a large amount of the blood goes to the pulmonary artery too so it's associated with increased pulmonary blood flow and hypoplastic left heart syndrome as i already told you associated with increased pulmonary blood flow now with the decreased pulmonary blood flow tetralogy of fallot associated with the pulmonary stenosis so blood flow will decrease pulmonary atresia is the name suggests when there is atresia of the pulmonary valve how can the blood flow through it okay so there will be decreased pulmonary blood flow tricuspid atresia as i already discussed atretic tricuspid valve the blood can't flow from the right atrium to the right ventricle and thus there will be decreased pulmonary blood flow and epstein anomaly i already explained in the diagram that there will be decreased pulmonary blood flow okay now coming back to the question the cyanotic heart disease that are associated with increased pulmonary blood flow are options were tetralogy of fallot epstein anomaly transposition of great arteries hypoplastic left heart syndrome and tricuspid atresia so now the correct options are option 3 tga and option 4 hypoplastic left heart syndrome these are the cyanotic heart disease which are uh, which are associated with increased pulmonary blood flow so the right answer is c okay so cardiology students it's very very important always the questions will be asked from pediatric cardiology in the exam so you can't leave this topic okay now again a very very important and common question central cyanotic heart disease with a boot shaped heart on x ray 
is seen in which of the following conditions? Tetralogy of phallic TOF, TAPVC, total anomalous pulmonary venous return, TGA, transposition of great artery and ventricular septal defect, VSD. Okay. So, firstly, central cyanotic heart disease. So, of these four options, the cyanotic heart disease are tetralogy of phallic is a cyanotic heart disease, TAPVC is a cyanotic heart disease, and TGA, transposition of great artery is a cyanotic heart disease. VSD, you all know, it's a acyanotic congenital heart disease with left to right shunt, LR shunt. Okay, so it's not a cyanotic heart disease. This option is over. Now you have three options A, B, and C left. Okay, now look at the options one by one. Tetralogy of phallic. The most important condition you all know the boot shaped heart is seen in tetralogy of phallic. Okay, so this is the boot shaped heart that you can see on the x ray. Okay, core and sabi appearance. And this boot shaped, why there is boot shaped heart? Because in tetralogy of phallic, you all know there is right ventricular hypertrophy is there, which is one of the component of this tetralogy, four components. Okay, and because of this right ventricular hypertrophy, there is boot shaped heart seen. And there is oligemic lung fields that you can see. Oligemic lung fields means that the vascularity, pulmonary vascularity, this is less. Can you make out? This is all blackout. So, this is the oligemic lung fields. Why? Because the pulmonary blood flow is decreased in tetralogy of phallic. Okay. Next, TAPVC, that is total anomalous pulmonary venous return. The most important x ray finding that you have to remember from the MCQ point of view is this figure of 8, also known as snowman appearance, figure of 8 appearance. So, this is characteristically seen in unobstructive supracardiac variety of TAPVC. Very important, this can be asked in MCQ. So, TAPVC, you don't see a boot shaped heart, instead, you see a figure of 8 appearance or a snowman up configuration. And this is because of the dilated superior vena cava. So, this is the dilated because of the dilatation of the superior vena cava. This is something that we see. Okay. Next, also because TAPVC is the condition which is associated with the increased pulmonary blood flow, so there will be plethoric lung fields. So, there will be the pulmonary vasculature is quite obvious in the lung fields. Okay. Now, transposition of great arteries. The third option that was given, transposition of great arteries. Again, the characteristic X-ray finding, chest X-ray finding is egg on side or egg on string appearance. So, can you make out this is the egg on the string? So, there is cardiomegaly because it's increased pulmonary blood flow is there. There is increased pulmonary vascularity that is the plethoric lung fields and egg on side or egg on string appearance is characteristically seen in TGA. Okay, so all these are MCQs. This time they have asked about the boot shaped heart but next time they can ask about any of these things. Okay, next question. What all are needed in a newborn IV cannulation among the following. So, this is something very practical question. So, you are posted in your nursery posting in the internship. So, IV cannulation is required in a newborn. So, what all things are needed? Very practical and common sense based question it is. Okay. So, firstly, the cannulas 22 gauge needle, 24 gauge needle, 5 ml syringe, normal saline, and adhesive tape. Okay. So, it's just an imagination based question, just imagine this thing that you are posted in your nursery and a newborn is there, you have to put in a cannula in the newborn. So, what all items you need? Number first, in order to cannulate, firstly you have to clean the skin for, with an alcohol swab. Okay, so you will use an alcohol swab firstly to clean. Number second, so, after the alcohol swab, you need the cannulas to be kept in the tray. Okay, you have to ready, get ready with the tray now. You have to go to the newborn. So, number second is the cannula. So, which cannula size? In the newborn, you use two cannula sizes. 26 gauge cannula and a 24 gauge cannula. Okay. So, this purple cannula that you see, this is the 26 gauge cannula. The smallest cannula that is present. Okay. And this yellow one is a 24 gauge cannula. So, somewhat bigger than this purple one. So, these are the two cannulas that we use in Niku. No other cannula will be seen in the Niku. Okay. So, these are the two cannulas. Next, after the cannula, what you need is after putting in the cannula, 
you need a flush you have to flush that cannula in order to see that it has been properly entered in the vein of the baby okay so for the flush what you need is a normally we require a 1 ml syringe because the caliber of the newborn's vein is very small so some the 5 ml syringe it will put on so much of pressure that the even the vein can rupture so a 1 ml syringe with a normal saline so need a normal saline bottle for the flush okay and then after flushing then you checked out that the cannula is normal then what you need is you have you need a tegaderm in order to place the cannula in position okay so then you need a tegaderm and sometimes you can also need a splint in order to because the cannula the child will uh, move the hands and the limbs so the cannula can move uh, fall apart so a splint in order to splint the cannula with the hand or the limb okay so splint so these are the six important items that are you are required to keep in your tray when you are going for the cannulation of a newborn so when you look at these options 22 gauge cannula needle no not at all 22 kg is a very big size we can't use that cannula in a newborn 24 gauge yes 24 or 26 you can use 5 ml syringe ideally no i told you a 1 ml syringe is required okay then normal saline and then adhesive tape yes but as in the options you see the option number 2 4 and 5 this option is not given in it so you have to put in the 3 this option 2 so as 1 ml syringe is not given but 5 ml is given but we have to write down the answer number c okay because the option 2 4 5 is not mentioned in the options okay so 2 3 4 5 is the answer option number c thank you